This is the IDP After Show. Hello, welcome to the IDP After Show. I am your host, Jeff Pumazov. Tonight, we're going to continue our IDP discussion and we're going to focus on the IDP show's IDP madness that the site hosted this past season. Managers were drafting 24 of their best players onto their squads. With no IR or waiver spots, it was kind of really a, a draft it and forget it type of league. So tonight, I'm joined by two amazing guests. I have the privilege this week of having my good friend Eric Harms help me break down and discuss our IDP Madness's winning team. Eric, how are you doing, my friend? I am fantastic. And I'd like to welcome this year's IDP Madness winner, Mr. Country Boy Swagger himself, Andrew Morgan. Andrew, thanks so much for taking some time and joining us here tonight talking a little best ball and kind of walking through this juggernaut of a team that you assembled and maybe helping the rest of us kind of take down your crown this year. So <laughs> welcome to yeah. the show. Thank you guys for having me on here. I, re I really appreciate it. So before we dive into Andrew's roster and his draft here, I want to ask you both. Do you think playing like in the, all of the other IDP leagues that you play in help you in best ball drafts? Uh, I think for me, it helps in the reverse more. Being all these IDP best balls helps me with the dynasties and the redraft leagues and stuff like that more, especially the IDP Invitational. We get so deep with all the defensive players, you really learn a whole complement of defensive players that are out there, especially in the 31 round, you know, IDP only, 12 teams. It's a lot of players that you're looking at. So to me, that's more of a benefit that way than it is that the best balls going towards the dynasties. It does help a little bit to be in the 32 teamers when you're getting deep. I mean, everybody in those is rostered. We have, in the ones I'm in, we have 53 man rosters. So you've got practice squad players on your team. It's everybody's taken. So you've got to know, know pretty deep anyway. Yeah. I always like to say we are playing some pretty deep leagues too. We, we draft some guys that their parents don't even know they're in the NFL. So <laughs> you know you're getting deep then, so. Yeah. Andrew, what are your, any thoughts? I, I definitely think it did having the, the deeper leagues and the dynasties and stuff did help with best ball only. And again, like most of my leagues are 16 teams or more and deep benches. And so, like you said, rostering guys that they might not even know they're on a team yet. So that helped a lot. Uh, me just name recognition and situ you know, situational based things. It's like, Oh, I have been looking at this guy for two months because I'm going to need someone in my 32 man league or something. And so it's towards the end of the round, I'm going to pick them up because I'm comfortable with that flyer. So it, it definitely helped me a lot. And when we get later on into talking about like your later part of the draft, since you knew the depth and things like that, you definitely nailed some of these last eight picks of your draft. So the real reason we're here tonight is to look at this draft. We're here to look at this roster. So Andrew, when you're drafting your team, this team was drafted from the eighth position. And so initially when you saw that you were in the eighth position, were you were you happy with the position? Were you kind of disappointed? What was what was your initial thought? So my worst fear is being dead center. So at least I wasn't at the sixth spot. <laughs> and so towards the, you know, back end of it, I wasn't super happy about it, but I'm I'm always okay being in my opinion being close to a turn somewhere. Obviously, if you're in the front half, you get some of those top players, but if I'm close to a turn, I'm happy with that. So that's how I look at that one. Eric, I'm going to spin it to you for here a second. So if you could pick your draft position in a format like this with IDP best ball, where would you ideally like to draft and why? This, this last season, it would have been number five because I wanted one of those defensive linemen was my strategy going in. So I wanted Parsons or Bosa or TJ Watt, Miles Garrett or Crosby. And by five, I get one of those five guys and then I'm closer on the back when you come back on the second round. So that would have been my ideal spot. Andrew, if you would have had an option to pick, I know you said you you, didn't, you would like to be more closer to the end. Would you like to be closer to the, the front end, one, two, three, or more of the 9, 10, 11? I don't know if I ever like having one, but three or four, I'm pretty happy with. I'm a big 49ers fan, so any chance I have of getting Nick Bosa, I'll take. But but no, I, if I had to pick a spot, it's I like within the within the – First three or last three, but this year I would have liked three or four. Well, you didn't get that in this draft. You ended up with the eighth spot. <clears throat> and then when we look at your team and your breakdown, you ended up drafting eight eligible defensive linemen. Three of those were hybrid D linemen, linebackers. Uh, Will Anderson, Jermaine Johnson, and Nolan Smith were those three players. You had five linebackers and 11 defensive backs. So 
clearly your draft strategy was linebacker early mm-hmm. by taking Foyo Luakon, Fred Warner, and Bobby Okereke in the first three picks. And then you kind of went D-back crazy and hammering that position. Was that your <laughs> plan going into the draft, or did you just kind of let that come to you and kind of evolve as it went? You know, I, I'd like to sit here and tell you I had it all mapped out, but it never goes as any of us want it to. Definitely linebacker early was my plan. Tackles, 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 tackles. That's all I was looking to aim for. If anything, I could fall back on my first three guys was my opinion. So I did get, I did, you know, strategic or lucky walking into that situation with Fred Warner and Bobby Okereke in two and three. And I, and I definitely, when I was looking at Anderson, I kind of, you know, hot rookie, pretty good position, right? You know, Niners fans love D'Amico Ryans. And so kind of that situation where I thought I'll, I'll take a guy who can, you know, play either position on my roster. So, and then, and then, yeah, I, DB heavy, give me some more tackles, get, load me up with as many safeties as I can, preferably in the box, but you know, teams nowadays will put them anywhere and everywhere. So that was my initial strategy. And so, Eric, I, I know that you might have a little bit different approach to it. So, you know, if you were drafting in the same spot, the eighth spot, what would your first couple picks look like? I would have taken a Luakon too at the eight. So many tackles. I, I typically want to get the, the splash play guys in at best ball. It's usually my strategy to get the guys that are going to sacks and hope that you get guys that hit every week on your roster. Second round, when he took Warner... Judon and Jalen Phillips were both on the board yet. I probably would have gone Jalen Phillips, but that ended up not, wouldn't have worked out very well. In fact, I did take those two players in the first two rounds. I took Phillips and then Judon at the end in the IDP madness. And they both got, they didn't play half the season, either one of them. So it kind of didn't work out very good for me. It was your fault. It was your fault. (laughs) It it was my fault. It was my fault. (laughs) Mine and Adams, it was our fault. Well, you weren't alone in that. So I had Judon and Phillips on several teams this year too. So I'll take some blame on that one. And then like Eric finishing up there, like the third round there, were you? Based on who was left there, that would have been tempting. This year I tended to reach a little bit for defensive linemen, maybe incorrectly. I probably would have taken Josh Allen there maybe. It was pretty early in the third. Greenlaw maybe was also available. It would have been tough for me. Greenlaw, Karake, or Josh Allen would have been a choice there, I think. I mean, there was a lot of good linebackers available right there. As uh, TJ Edwards was there, would have been a choice. Probably would have reached for Josh Allen. And again, it's pretty easy to sit here in into January, reflecting back on a draft that was April, May, or June. You know, like, oh, you know, this is what we could have done. So, you know, when you're in that moment, it's very different. So, Andrew, you kind of mentioned that you're a 49ers fan. Did your fan bias influence you at all into taking like like Fred Warner here? And I know later on you took Jackson. Actually, your true first defensive lineman, Jackson, you took him in the ninth round. So was there any fan bias in your draft? So I, again, I'd love to say I'm, I'm good at not doing that, but I'm pretty bad at it. You know, I think, I think I get lucky with, with the Fred Warner pick in the sense that he's great. Everyone loves him. Right. And so that's kind of nice that he's there. I can take him, and it's not a bag of pick when it comes to Jackson. Yeah. That I think a a little bit of 49er bias came in. What I, what really was driving me on that pick was where I was at in the draft. I didn't have any, you know, specific defensive linemen. I had a lot of those players that had dual tags on them. And I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to do it, now's a chance to do it. I did like his production last year and where he was at in the back half of the season, the last four weeks of the season. Obviously, you know, again, hindsight's 2020. It didn't necessarily go that way. He was a pop star on my team and they ended up trading for Chase Young. But yeah, that's where my mindset was. I was probably 30% like, oh, it's a 49er, and 70% like, I think I can get some production out of this guy. That was my my hope. Andrew, is there any lessons that you learned playing this year that maybe you'll apply next year as a, a little bit of a strategy? One thing I noticed on my team was I got hit with the injury bug, kind of like coming into week five or six, if I recall, I started racking up some injuries. And I, you know, obviously you can't add anybody. I started to panic a little bit. You can't really predict that kind of stuff. But I think my to my lesson to myself on that one is I think I would probably try and disperse my picks. Just I was aiming for like 
green dot players. I was aiming for box safeties and, and I kind of just stuck myself in that hole and they started to get hurt throughout the season. And I didn't really reach out to, you know, some, some maybe more advantageous corners or maybe, you know, a second string or third string linebacker that I was willing, I kind of just stuck myself with grab as many starting key role players as I could and they get hurt eventually. So try and disperse myself from all the starting guys and try and pick up some backups to, save myself later on and, and we mentioned you know like the 49er fandom and stuff like that and injuries and then you your fifth pick was a funga so then you know he was probably one of those guys that you were like yep. really banking on to have a successful season and like you yep. said about week five week six all of a sudden like ooh, i lost him yeah your next pick minka fitzpatrick kind of all of a sudden started in and out of the lineup and stuff like that so yeah there was definitely a hairy time in your season where it wasn't really it, i was a little worried i was a little worried there for a minute you know well, let's kind of recap here, like the first eight picks. And then Eric, I'm going to spin it over to you and just kind of say like, which, which pick of this spot on a draft did you feel like was the best pick, best value, or however you interpret that. So we let off with Foyo Luakon. We had Fred Warner, Bobby Okereke, Will Anderson, Hufunga, Minka Fitzpatrick, Kyle Hamilton, and then Antonio Winfield. So of those top eight picks, Eric, who, who was the, the winner there in your mind? Based on what happened, Winfield. <laughs> yeah. That guy was a stud this year. Yeah. Getting him an eighth round. And, and I'm one that likes to wait on defensive backs, but that guy was a monster. And that pick is just, that's a great pick. Yeah, scoring 278 points this season. He was the the clear-cut DB1 this year. And it, and it wasn't even close. You know, he even kind of got snubbed for the Pro Bowl there. And yeah. then all of a sudden he got kind of written in there at the end, but like very clearly deserving of that. He was on 41% of all best ball madness teams that reached the top three in their division. So, you know, if you, if you didn't have Winfield, you were already had less than 60% chance of winning. So definitely wow. needed on that team. Andrew, as you look back now, like obviously Alu Khan was a great pick. He was on 25% or 27% of all of the teams that made it to the top, top three in each division. Is there one pick that you're like, wow, that was, that was the, the one that won it for me. I mean, Antoine Winfield, that's a hard one to disagree with. I I remember all the months ago in the draft thinking, I I know everyone's really like aiming for these defensive linemen and trying to get big play sacks. I was just shocked that I was able to get four safeties in a row, starting safeties who play a lot of snaps and get a lot of tackles, you know, sometimes come down on blitz packages and they're in the box. Like I, I was really shocked to get four in a row. Obviously Hamilton and Hufunga had injury issues and stuff, but it, Winfield's hard to disagree with. If I had to pick a close second for me, I think Okereke, I was pretty happy that I was able to get him in the third round because he produced pretty well. I mean, if anything, just consistent. I never had to worry about him or the amount of points he was going to get me. It was always going to be above a certain number. And it, and I was, it was a, for me, I was happy I snuck him out of the third. And, and I couldn't agree more with the Oluokan pick. Like he is just, has been number one, number two linebacker for the last three seasons. Right. He's as steady as they come. For me, I think probably, you know, obviously not taking anything away from Winfield, but the, the Okereke pick in the third round, he finished the season as the number two linebacker on the season. Yeah, um, He was on 34% of all IDP winning teams. And so you walked away from with your first eight picks, having the number one, number two linebacker and the number one defensive back. So that's a, that's a great start to any draft, you know, and then to be best ball, you know, that's, yeah. You've just already gotten a head start on the season. And again, it's easy to sit back and look at the end of January about this, but that's kind of the learning process. You know, that was one right. of those takeaways that you learn from. We tend to take a look at the next eight picks. So this middle round, we mentioned Drake Jackson already. Leonard Williams, who was on the New York Giants at the time you drafted him, ended up in Seattle. Derek Brown, Brian Branch, Richie Grant, Jermaine Johnson, Nolan Smith, and then Julian Love. So Eric, we'll start with you. Of that tier of the draft who do you feel was the league winner here for andrew well there's two of them i really like in here all right we'll, we'll let you have both of them i'll let somebody else pick one of them i'll go with jermaine johnson and let andrew have the other one it was a great year for him he started getting a little bit buzz getting closer to the season and started moving up the drafts a little bit as i noticed you know he was drafted pretty late into the 20s and stuff, mid early 20s, but he kept climbing closer to the season we got. He had a great year for the Jets. I think he will again next year. He's definitely a, a budding young star there in New York. 
And he's one of those players too, that like you said, Eric, he's just an ascending player. Like when he was drafted out of Florida state, he didn't even really, that was his first year playing that true position in Florida state. And so he's really just kind of learning the position. And it's scary to think that even in his second year that he's playing as well as he is, he's playing on a, a, for a team and a coach that really, really values that position and possibly getting even more snaps next season. So I, I am all in on Jermaine Johnson. He just happened to be on 36% of all of the, the top three teams in each league too. So, you know, here again, you know, a late pick with Andrew and he, he knocked it out of the park and maybe was one of those guys that put him over the top, especially late in the season. He really came on there. So, right. So since Eric was nice enough, Andrew, to give you the layup on the second one, who is, who's the player you feel that's in this part of the, the draft that you, was good for you? I hope well, he picks I, what I was thinking. <laughs> I, I thought was exactly who he said. I was just beyond happy to have him. I, I'm, I'm not sure who you were thinking, but who I'm going to go with, I, I could pick another two players here just based on scoring. I really like Julian Love, who I pulled off in there, but – well, mine was Brian Branch. I, I liked having Brian Branch, especially, right, he starts getting the momentum and we have some injuries with the Lions DBs. And that one, if anything, if the way I look at it is that that pick saved me when Hafunga went down or when Minka was injured or Hamilton. That was who I was going to go with after Jermaine Johnson. Yeah, he, Brian Branch finished the season as the number 20 scoring defensive back, which is outstanding for a rookie. Right. You know, and to get him where you did, like in the – like the twelfth round, and like you said, he kind of filled in those weeks. Just when Hufunga and Fitzpatrick were going down, he was really starting to ascend and insert himself into that lineup. After the injury to C.J. Gardner Johnson, you know, he just kind of really stepped up and for that Dan right. Campbell's defense. So, right. I would have to agree. I I have a huge man crush on Jermaine Johnson, so I had him <laughs> rostered on a lot of teams. And I'm very happy with him going forward, especially in dynasty teams. So I was also going to shout out Derek Brown was my other one. That, I was considering. I was so close to that one. Yeah. I, I think maybe I'm holding some ill will because the weeks I really wanted him, he'd have yeah. one tackle, but over the course of the season, it was a great spot to draft him. Yep. I tend to fade the defensive backs. People that drafted with me know I, they would tease me when I drafted a, a guy in the top 15 picks uh, the top 15 rounds yeah. I'd take a defensive back I'd get teased if they drafted with me enough but I tend to overlook them but that was a good pick with Brian Branch and just like the thing with Jermaine Johnson again like having that dual eligibility especially in a format like this where he, he could have those boom weeks where he's in as a defensive lineman you know if one of your other six or seven defensive linemen's on a bye or if he had a really good week he could still be in that linebacker or flex spot so just those players with those dual eligibilities are, you know, kind of cheat codes in some of these formats. So, and that's kind of, I, I know we went over overall strategy, but that's like where I was at in the draft at the eight spot, I, you know, the, like the defensive linemen, the edge guys that I really wanted were already off the board. And so if I'm do linebacker for the first four rounds, I know the big name defensive lineman guys are going to be off the board, start pocketing them. But the dual eligibility guys are the ones who really I started focusing on towards this part because I was like, I need to fill in those spots and I might as well make them guys who are at least going to get some tackles and some possibly some sacks. Yeah. And I think the, the Will Anderson pick that you picked at fourth is a great example of that too. He's, he's that, you know, super hype rookie coming in on a great spot draft capital. He's going to get a lot of snaps and, he just happens to have dual eligibility too to help out with right. filling in those gaps. Especially right. in the 24 round leagues, it was more important than those not as deep of a bench to get those guys. Yeah, that's right. a great point too, Eric. Just because if you, you know, like you did suffer an injury to somebody, you know, there's some, there are probably many teams out there that were suffering from goose eggs in positions because they didn't have anyone eligible for those spots. So, right. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, great points. So, Last half of the draft, this is where the winners are separated. Started off in the 17th round with Reed Blankenship, Kirby Joseph, Boye Mafe, Devin Bush, Lorenzo Carter, Kenny Clark, Joe Horn, and ended the draft with Darius Slay. So, Eric, looking at this draft right now, where did where was the draft one here for Andrew? Well, with my hat, you think I might go with one guy, but I'm actually going to go with Boye Mafe. A uh, guy was a beast for a good portion of the year. I think he might have also been, he's listed as a defensive lineman. I think he also might have been dual eligible with linebacker as well. 
Yes. So just a huge piece there that late in the draft. That was round 19, eighth pick of the 19th round. So really played. I mean, you could have gone like Ebiketti or somebody somewhat similar, but uh, you picked the right guy for sure. Totally agree. And then Andrew, same question to you. Like, where, where do you feel that this was the where you won on the draft here? If you would have asked me that question day after the draft, you know, I might have said one of the last two DBs I took, you know, maybe, you know, they might get something, they might end up having a great season. You know, I might've, I might've also said Carter or Bush thinking, Hey, you know what? It's the last four or five rounds. It, they might pop off. They might end up in a great situation, especially when, you know, Bush changing teams, but asking me that question right now, I'm absolutely have to agree with him. It was just boy. Mafe was the pick that I thought, you know what? I, I might not get a lot of points from him, but I'm going to have, a, I'll be able to have a floor, a solid floor with this, with this guy. And, and it ended up being a pretty nice floor. There's a bit of luck involved with everything we're doing here. Injury, you know, stuff like that. If a guy's out sick, something like that, but I'll bring it back to Drake Jackson attacking that, you know, defensive line room. There's a clear cut number one in that room. And if the one, if Bosa goes down, then it's kind of, okay, who do we think can fill in here? And I really like what everyone saw at Drake Jackson in, in the Seattle room. I, it, there isn't a clear one. I don't think, I mean that you can say statistically there's one that's better than another, but, but if one guy goes down or two guys go down, anybody could be the guy who can take a shot there or pop off with some skill. So really I just, in that position, that late in the draft, I thought I wanted to attack one of the guys who I thought was better, someone who I know is going to get some snaps. Maybe it'll turn out. And like I said, I was hoping for a decent floor, and I, I, I was happy with what I got. So I know you don't want to give away all your secrets because you want to be, come back as the returning champion of the IDP Madness again. But is there any different approach next season that you're going to attack a draft with? That's a great question. I try and have a draft strategy based on where I'm drafting and where I'm at. It could be different completely. I think, I think if I end up in the same position I was in last year, if I'm either between eight and the last pick in the first round, you know, I tend, I tend to just load up on position, sure fire positions. They're line top linebackers, you know, like, like, Eric was saying, I generally, I'm not attacking defensive backs, you know, very early, especially in a format like this. It just doesn't make any sense. But in that situation I was in this year, attacking it where I did when I did while two, you know, Hofungo was out for the rest of the year after his injury and Minka came back and forth. They still provided me points when I needed them. And it ended up paying off for me there. And obviously Winfield, I think if I had to come back next year with a different strategy, assuming I'm in a different position, draft position, you know, defensive, the defensive edges, the lines, that's where I'll probably focus fast and quick right there, get that out of the way. And then, and then start filling in a healthy linebacker core and then go right back to what I did. I like interchanging the defensive backs and a backup position. Whatever the position that I've ignored for the first eight picks, my, the next eight picks for me usually are attack the position I ignored and then the very next pick, fill in a backup. And I just keep rotating that until I feel happy with my lineup. I know Eric's answered this question, so Andrew, I'll ask you first. When you're drafting a team and you see like your defensive lineman five of three, your linebackers five of three and your defensive backs, whatever number of like six, do you panic when that number is a, a zero? So yeah, there's a little panic in there. There's a little panic this year threw me because again, I did a lot of dual eligible players and it linebacker was like 10 of five. And then it started to backfill the defensive line. But no, if I, any draft, any league I'm in, if I am, you know, a third of the way through it and I still have a zero on a position, I start to sweat bullets and I, you know, it starts to freak me out a little bit. So Eric, same question to you, like kind of looking forward, you know, I don't want to give away all your secrets as well, but as you approach a draft next year, you you played in many basketball drafts this last season. What's your strategy? What's your approach? And did you learn anything this year that you're going to maybe change your draft plan next year? My strategy probably won't change a whole lot. Um, I'll still be looking for the defensive linemen early. They're the ones that more consistently are good from year to year. Um, the farther you get from the ball, the less consistent that is. So I'll probably stick with that, but I won't be as hard about it because I, there was some drafts. I tried to change it up um, draft to draft a little bit 
at least between defensive linemen and linebackers. And I found that the ones I won, there were a couple I had five or six defensive linemen in the first six picks. But there was also some that I had even three linebackers, three defensive linemen. Some of those were dual eligible. And, and I won that way too. So I think I'll be a little bit more willing this year to go to the linebackers and, and take them when they're a value there versus trying to force a defensive lineman in there. I won't change my strategy with defensive backs. <laughs> there were times in a 30 round, 31 round draft, I didn't draft one until the 22nd round. So that's okay. I hope Winfield comes back to me anyway. So that works out. <laughs> I, I will tell you there, I did in a couple that I won have a, a once in the eighth round and once in the 10th round where I drafted a defensive back and it was Winfield both times if I remember right. So Winfield and Hamilton, I think maybe. Did you lose any sleep that night drafting a defensive back so early? No, but you know, I did, I did get chided by Andrew Preston. Shout out to Andrew. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure after the leagues were over, you slept pretty well collecting your league winnings yeah. and stuff like that too. So, well, that's just about it for this week's episode of the IDP After Show. Eric, any words of advice, wisdom for our listeners kind of going forward about IDP Bandits or just IDP in general? Play it. Play all the best balls you can fit in. It's a lot of fun. You learn a lot about the IDP players and you get in, they'll start about a week after the Super Bowl or right after the Super Bowl. So start getting in on that makes the off season fun. You can draft all the time. They just keep rolling them out. And then by the time you get to the madness, you've got kind of seeing how players are getting drafted. And it's interesting to see how it changes throughout the off season as the rookies get drafted as free agency you go through that and there's a lot of linebackers in free agency this year. So it'll be interesting this year to see what happens February versus, you know, April and May with all the changing of positions there. So I couldn't agree more play as play as much as you can. I, this was my first year with the best ball definitely won't be my last. Uh, That was a lot of fun. Been playing, you know, use doing IDP for many years and yeah if you're not if you're not drafting idp then you're not really drafting (laughs) well i want to thank you both for taking time out of your schedules coming on to the show and chatting with us tonight a little bit about idp a special shout out to dj keltown for putting down some amazing work breaking down all of the idp bandits drafts creating some fantastic spreadsheets that uh, break down roster percentage and ownership and just which uh, teams all of those winning players were on so um, next time, Evan Ringler and I will be breaking down an intro to IDP. So we kind of mentioned about getting involved, start playing those things. So Evan and I are going to be breaking down an intro for managers and also for leagues are looking to maybe make the switch to IDP. So hope you join me for that. In the meantime, be sure to visit the idpshow.com this season. There's everything from rankings to prop bets, trade advice, and much, much more. So for Eric Harms and Andrew Morgan, this is Jeff Pumazal saying thank you for joining us and hope to see you next time. This was the IDP After Show.